the University of Missouri and uh, giving a talk today on uh, making monads first class potential. Uh, this is a, uh, you're ready to hear me? Okay. Um, this is a point of work with uh, Pericles Cariotis, who's another uh, grad student in the lab, and uh, my advisor Bill Harris. Quiz of sorts, but uh, you don't have to worry because it's multiple choice and all the questions are rhetorical anyway. Um, I want you to uh, circle the best answer. Um, one has R. Warm and fuzzy. Yeah, exactly. One, a powerful programming tool in Haskell. Two, an organizing principle for language semantics. Or three, notorious for their C framework. Okay, well, uh, I would say that the answer is four, all of the above. Um, so the dilemma uh, that really motivates uh, the work that I'm uh, presenting here today uh, is how to actually explain uh, the basic material, just uh, the idea of monads, uh, to new uh, <coughs> programmers. And I think, uh, probably speaking, there are two different uh, views one can take. Uh, you can take the bird's eye view of uh, monads. Uh, we know that monads are great because they're a way of dealing with uh, effects or uh, effect-like things in your language, uh, etc. Or one can take the worm's eye view, where you start uh, with sort of the ground level uh, construction and try to work out there to the, you know, to the high level abstractions. Um, and which direction uh, do we, we want to approach this from? Do we start, start at the top, start at the bottom, or start somewhere else? Um, this is a problem that applies uh, regardless of what your audience is. So whether you're trying to explain your class to, uh, let's say, uh, a roof full of undergraduates, or even a roof full of teaching computer scientists who aren't the, uh, necessarily, let's say, programming language heads. Uh, it's, it's hard to know where to start. So the question we ask them is, uh, is there some middle ground? Is, is there some, some, somewhere we can go in between? Uh, is there a way that we can explain uh, monads that uh, allows us to uh, uh, give people the bird's eye view and understand the, uh, uh, the important ideas, and yet at the same time also give them a tool for moving forward and actually uh, you know, starting the program and uh, sort of hack with monads uh, as a beginner? So this is much more uh, than a pedagogical concern. Uh, what we call the lore of monad construction. Uh, we claim that it uh, intimidates potential new users of Haskell, uh, and therefore uh, it really does uh, impede the growth of the Haskell community. So if we can make monads easier, that's good for Haskell. So uh, you can imagine for a moment, and I, I think that you have to imagine that we don't know anything about monads, uh, and I have to do that to you. Uh, conceptually, uh, there are various ways in which I can try Explain them to you. Um, I can just them as a semantic Lego, uh, abstract and abstract data type approach to languages, mix and match DSLs, modular interpreters. There are all these nice, you know, key ideas and high level uh, concepts. They're actually, I think, fairly easy to grasp for, for the for the mode ad maybe. Um, the question, uh, the really important question, is how we actually go from understanding these intuitions, but yeah, it's not necessarily that hard, to actually programming with monads, actually getting our hands dirty and using them. Uh, our claim is that uh, the disconnect here results from sort of a uh, lack of abstraction, or rather uh, a difference in the level of abstraction at which we think about as, whether we design a monad well, I want a state, I want uh, an environment, I want non determinism, and the level at which we actually construct. Um, so our approach to dealing with this um, is to hide the details of monad construction uh, in a specific language. Okay? So just to put things in uh, sort of a Historical context just to motivate things a little bit. Um, we all know this. Uh, we know it's uh, very nice in a lot of ways. Um, there are a lot of uh, sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of or, you know, data structures and such that are possible over this. But uh, when it comes to the actual, let's say, implementation of those data structures, uh, you're often forced to, to uh, put things together in terms of concepts. And you're you know, sort of hacking around with uh, to allow us some very rich abstractions uh, when dealing with this. So uh, sometime after this, uh, along, come in, along comes ML, and ML introduces the data type of declaration okay, We're not uh, plugging things together by hand with the uh, We don't have more our data types any longer. Uh, and the introduction of this new uh, declaration form, uh, it gives us a lot, in, uh, a lot of uh, expressive power. It allows us to think at a high level about our uh, data types, and uh, we don't have to worry about implementation details. Um, so we'll compare this, uh, fairly or unfairly, with uh, Haskell, 
uh, in which monads uh, also provide an incredibly expressive computational paradigm. And we all know that we all know and love monads, we know why they're great. But um, actually constructing monads okay, often requires a lot of uh, heavy lifting, no, uh, no pun intended. So uh, our offering uh, to, kind of, uh, uh, to make this easier uh, is a domain-specific language called Monad Lab. And Monad Lab, uh, essentially, uh, you can think of it as uh, extending Haskell with a new declaration form uh, for Monads. So the first class declaration form. OK, so let's uh, take a look at what that looks like. Um, a Monad Lab program uh, it consists of a Monad declaration and uh, zero or more uh, Haskell uh, type or data declarations like you're familiar with. Um, so we see that a Monad uh, declaration has the form of T1 plus whatever plus TI, or T and other. Um, so each of these TIs, uh, it's a Monad transformer that's built into Monad Lab. So each one of these things that's being uh, linked together by pluses is something like a state transformer or an environment transformer or uh, whatever. We'll see the exact form in a moment. Um, when we run this through uh, the Monad Lab uh, front end, a Haskell module is generated uh, with declarations for that Monad. So its type, um, its instance in the Monad class, unit, bind, all the non-profit morphisms, uh, those are all generated for you. Um, one important thing to note here, um, and uh, I just want to allude to this now, and I'll get back to it later, is that uh, this uh, sum here, what, uh, what looks like a sum, t1 plus uh, dot, 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 plus tn, the actual order in which the Monad transformers will be applied may differ from the order in which, uh, in which they occur here, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, in due course. Okay. So let's uh, look at things with, uh, with a simple example. Uh, we're going to start with a simple language of terms, and uh, there's a slightly more uh, rich example in the paper that you can look at if you like as well. We'll start out with a simple language of terms, uh, integer constants and addition. Okay, nothing too fancy here. Well, um, what's the associated monad for this when we go to write an interpreter? Uh, since there's no need for any real uh, rich effects here, we'll just declare m to be the identity monad. Okay, nothing fancy. Uh, the interpreter for this, again, there's, there's nothing uh, particularly surprising uh, about, this, uh, about this interpreter. We have a turn, we have a uh, bind, and we have all the, uh, all the normal monad morphisms that we would get uh, in the uh, identity monad. The one thing that uh, you should note is that the n here, which is uh, highlighted in red, well, that, uh, that uh, type is automatically generated for us by monad lab. Another thing that monad lab gives you uh, is an automatically generated run function, uh, which has type one might expect, m a to a. So we have a computation in this monad, and monad automatically, uh, automatically generates one function that allows us to push a button to make that computation go. Okay, so simple, uh, simple enough example. Um, so we're getting a feel for things. Let's go ahead and add let binding uh, to our language. So we'll go ahead to the next one. Uh, I'm going to extend the language of terms with let binding and uh, variable uh, lookups, and then extend the monad with an environment transform. Okay? So we now have uh, our first sort of non-trivial monad lab monad declaration. Uh, there are three pieces here. Uh, the first one is nft, that's sort of built in in the monad lab language. It means we want to apply the environment transformer. Uh, the next guy in between the parentheses is environ, so that's the type of environments that we're threading through our computation. And then uh, we also give uh, this particular layer of the monad a name or a tag, uh, the name for which will become apparent in a moment. Okay? So we've extended our monad. The next step is to extend our interpreter. So we're going to start with the very same interpreter and just tack on some more cases for dealing with the uh, environment-oriented uh, features of the language. So once again, uh, there's nothing. Uh, there's not going to be anything here that, uh, that's terribly surprising. Uh, the one thing that's uh, notable is that uh, the read and in uh, functions here again are automatically generated by monad. We have an environment transformer, so we need read and in uh, morphisms. Um, that's the exact name here. Uh, that probably requires just a little bit of explanation. Uh, the name here is generated from, uh, so every environment component in Monad will have a read and an in operation. And we get this name simply by concatenating the name of that layer and the name of that of the Monad. Uh, the reason we do that is mostly just for disambiguation. Uh, we might have more than one environment, and certainly we might, we might have more than one Monad. So we need to sort of uh, build up this, uh, uh, this function name to uh, keep things distinct. So, uh, we're also um, is that because uh, we extended the uh, monad with environments, uh, run m, 
now has a type not of MA to A, but MA to environment to A. So uh, run M still automatically generated for us. Okay, so uh, we get the rhythm of it now. Um, let's go ahead and uh, start piling on the topics. Uh, I'm going to add a state to my language. So we'll just have a single rule for counter that we can get or set, and a sequence uh, uh, term type for uh, sequencing um, the sequentially composing effectful operations. And then we simply add a state t component to the monad to handle that. So the state is an int, and the state is called counter. Uh, that output to the line. is list. Okay? So we've built this, uh, built up this complicated internet, and uh, let's see what the interpreter looks like. Okay? Well, um, a couple things to note here. First of all, the black parts up here, uh, these are unchanged from the previous iteration. This is just the same uh, interpreter we had before in the environment of that. Um, down here, um, once again, all the operations for state, get count, uh, those are automatically generated. Uh, the functions for output automatically generated, and the functions for non-determinism automatically generated. So uh, even from this uh, quite uh, complex monad that we have here, uh, all the stuff we need uh, is just automatically built up for us by monad. Uh, and uh, the same will uh, continue to hold for the run function. Okay? Uh, what was previously MA to A, then MA to environ to A, is now MA to environ to int, because we have a state of type int, to a list of A, and we can also uh, insert a call to listen out M. That's for the writer transformer, so we can actually pull out the uh, output that was uh, given to us um, uh, during the course of the computation. All right, so hopefully you find this example uh, at least uh, somewhat compelling. Um, and uh, uh, we'll switch gears now and go ahead and sort of open the hood and uh, see how this works underneath. And as it turns out, uh, what's under the hood is Teclid Haskell. Uh, so if you haven't heard of Teclid Haskell before, uh, it's basically an extension of sort of uh, the core uh, Haskell language that allows you to compute uh, parts of your program source uh, statically. Uh, the mechanism for this is there's a, a new construct called uh, quoting. So we can take, for example, expressions or types or patterns and put them in, in sort of these funky uh, square brackets. Um, anything built up in this way can then be spliced into the program text using the dollar operator. So, um, for example, I can take lambda x, y, x plus y, stick that in quotes, uh, and what I have is a representation of the code for that function that can be spliced in later. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side here, you'll notice that if I quote an expression, I get something of type qx. If I quote a type, I get something of type q type, and so on. Um, if I quote declarations, I actually get a list of declarations, just a minor detail. Another thing you'll notice is that all of it is in this q monad, or the quotation monad. Um, exactly what that does isn't terribly important uh, for our purposes, so don't worry about it. So internally, uh, the main entry point to monad lab is a function called make monad. And all make monad takes is the name for the monad, so like M in, in the examples that we uh, showed you. Uh, just the uh, abstract uh, syntax for the monad lab de uh, declaration, and produces uh, Q-deck. This point seems to be failing here. Produces a Q-deck, uh, which is the declarations corresponding to this monad. So, we run through template Haskell, some declarations fall out. Uh, so what exactly, exactly what declarations does it produce? It produces a type declaration for the monad, an instance declaration for the monad type class, so we can still use it with all the normal uh, monad type class stuff. Uh, it generates return and bind. Uh, Non-proper morphisms, so things like uh, the get and state operations for the state monad, or the in and read operations for the environment monad, those are all generated automatically. And it also generates, as we saw, a run function, so we can actually make our computations do something. So once we've constructed that, uh, once we've gotten that out of the monad, we can then take those declarations, which again have type Q deck, and splice them into our program by wrapping them up in a dollar sign. So we, since we have make monad, uh, the monad is named C, and there's a single uh, integer uh, component named label count of type int. So this might be monad you use for a compiler or something like that. Uh, or another thing we could do is just pretty print them, which is actually what the front end does. Moving on. Um, so the front end, um, 
just to you know, give a, a bird's eye uh, view of it, uh, it simply takes a monad, a monad declaration in concrete syntax, runs it through a parser, spits out abstract syntax, uh, make monad, takes the uh, monad declaration, uh, uses template Haskell to generate uh, types and functions and so forth for, uh, uh, for the monad. That gets run to the pretty printer and it's spit out into a Haskell module, which you can now import. So uh, you get a monad declaration in and a Haskell module implementing that monad out. So uh, just in case you're curious, uh, or you might be curious at this point about what the generated code actually looks like, uh, let's take another simple declaration here. So we have one state component of type int named S, one environment component of type environment named E, and uh, you run this through uh, the front end, uh, do a little bit of uh, alpha renaming, uh, and this is uh, what gets uh, spat out. So um, I, I think uh, the only point uh, I really want to make here is that for the code that falls out here, um, if you think about what you actually have to do to write this monad by hand, this is reasonably close. So monad lab seems to generate a, you know, reasonably efficient uh, implementations of these monads, and that's something that we're uh, pleased with. Okay, so one, uh, one sort of important uh, technical point here, um, uh, switching gears again, if, you, uh, if you've ever used the uh, monad transformer library uh, to build up a monad, um, you know that uh, getting the order of transformer application right uh, can sometimes be tricky. So one, uh, I guess, classic example is uh, the state monad transformer versus the error monad transformer. Let's say you have state and error in the monad. Uh, if you apply state, you actually end up with a substantially different monad from what you get if you apply state before error. In one of them, let's say you have a catch error uh, block, uh, and uh, inside the body of that, an exception is thrown. Uh, but with one of them, when the exception or when the error is thrown, uh, any changes to the state that have, that have taken place up to that point will be rolled back before we go to the, uh, to the error end. And the other one, changes to the state are not rolled back. So uh, the only point, uh, uh, only real point there is that uh, order of transformer application sometimes matters. And this is part of the uh, sort of monad construction war that, we're, that I was talking about in the introduction. So in, in terms of dealing with this, uh, we made a design choice uh, pretty early on that we wanted any reordering of these layers to produce an equivalent monad. If you take your state and your environment, flip them around in that sum, you want the same monad to pop out. Um, you know, or I put it in a slightly geekier way, plus must you. Um, so in particular, and there are a lot more details on this in the paper, uh, continuation transformers are always applied first, error transformers are always applied last, and otherwise the transformers are applied in order from right to left. Uh, once again, there are more details in the paper. Okay, um, moving on to conclusions here. Um, so we think that uh, what Monad Lab gives you is what we uh, like to call uh, first-class monads. Um, and what I mean by first-class is simply that Monad Lab uh, hides the details of uh, Monad implementation, freeing you to uh, think at a higher level and uh, you know, just actually uh, program the darn things. Uh, the means by which we achieve this is a novel declaration form uh, called Monad. Uh, we think that Monad Lab gives you uh, simplicity. And uh, what we mean by simplicity here, uh, well, Let's say you're uh, setting out to learn a new programming language. Uh, what's the strategy you use to, to do that uh, usually? Typically, if you're learning a new programming language, you don't uh, say pick up the reference manual and uh, sit down within your room and just read from cover to cover over uh, the course of the weekend. You could do that, but uh, I don't. Um, and so uh, the way to, that you uh, usually learn a new programming language is by examples, right? Uh, you, get, you go out and get some examples, you tweak them, you break them, you fix them, you extend them, you break them, you fix them. And uh, uh, this is how you uh, become uh, comfortable with a new language. And I think that uh, in the case of uh, Lonax and Haskell, um, a lot of this uh, sort of, the difficulty of constructing, uh, constructing them and um, uh, sort of puts up a barrier to that kind of uh, what we call the hello world approach to, to learning the language. So making monads more accessible, making them easier to just jump in with, uh, is actually a pretty big thing. Um, from another angle, uh, we'd also say that uh, uh, Monad Lab provides a non-trivial uh, case study uh, for the use of Template Haskell. Uh, template Haskell, it's actually a very powerful tool, <coughs> but unfortunately, uh, in our opinion, it's somewhat underutilized. Um, the, uh, uh, the most uh, sort of interesting and uh, important things about Template Haskell is that uh, it has this paradigm of essentially generating code uh, and then delaying the type checking until uh, uh, essentially a later phase of the program. And for what we're doing here, uh, this is actually quite useful. 
Uh, furthermore, Monad Lab, we hope, will uh, give us a good uh, tool for teaching uh, monadic semantics and programming. Uh, so we're going to put our monad to our mouth is and uh, actually use it in our uh, undergraduate functional programming course at MU next semester as a supplement to uh, Graham Hutton's uh, programming at Haskell. Okay. Um, so from, from a language design point of view, um, we all know that uh, monads are a central and a very powerful abstraction at Haskell. Monads are important, right? Um, but this abstraction sometimes uh, does not uh, feel so abstract uh, simply because of the difficulty in construct uh, construction and implementation. Uh, the Monad Transformer Library helps, but there are a few problems with it in that, first of all, you have to be comfortable with the type class system. And the type class system is a wonderful thing, but it's not always very easy for new users to grasp. Uh, second, order of Monad Transformer applications is important uh, in the uh, MTL, whereas we uh, do our best to sort of handle that for you. Uh, three, lifting of uh, monad operations can be complex. And finally, and this is a point I didn't touch on too much, but it's covered a little more in the paper, multiple applications of the same transformer uh, can be tricky, but monad lab handles that. No problem. <coughs> um, now, the exact declaration language that we saw here with uh, this plus and this uh, transformer specification, uh, it's important to understand that uh, what you're looking at is version 0.0.0.1. Uh, the language uh, is continuing to evolve. So, um, Going back to the example of state T versus error T, uh, and where we make uh, what might seem like essentially an arbitrary decision for how to, to layer things for you there, um, it, it's entirely possible that as we uh, continue to develop this, um, we'll have a sort of a richer and more expressive uh, language of uh, monadic construction that, uh, that we can build. Uh, but nevertheless, we think that the basic approach of a novel declaration form and of uh, making monads first class, hiding the, uh, uh, the underlying uh, implementation details, uh, you know, we think we've demonstrated the utility of that. Um, so the main, uh, I guess the main and final point uh, I want to leave you with is simply that we really do think we have something here which has, uh, which makes monads easier to use, and making monads easier to use uh, will help grow the Haskell community. Right? So with that, uh, I want to thank you for listening and uh, I'll mention any questions.
how exactly to get around that uh, is an important uh, future question for uh, exploring the design space. Um, but, uh, exactly what that looks like, uh, you know, we're, not, we're not quite sure yet. So does your paper document accurately all the different elements you supply in what order you put them in? Yes. You didn't document that accurately in the talk. Yeah, uh, it, it, it says, I guess. Because th that's probably one of the interesting places to have a discussion, is if you're going to do this, what's the right set of things to do? The other question I was going to ask is, basically, what the reason this helps is because you have a certain set of functions, and then you put your transformer, and if you're doing it by hand, you have to lift all those things by hand, right. and you don't want to do that. Um, the generative programming community, I think, has looked at this question how you put together bits of things useful solutions that you could have adopted off the shelf. Um, well, um, I think mostly, mostly uh, again, we, we were just sort of queuing into the idea of uh, just sort of porting your classic uh, monad transformers uh, into type of Haskell. Uh, but there are uh, sort, of, sort of some other uh, ideas, you know, sort of alternatives to monad transformers and stuff, uh, uh, if I'm kind of answering the right question here. Uh, that we uh, that we uh, considered, so there uh, there are various alternatives that are discussed in the, the later part of the paper. Um, but but no, I mean everything is just done using kind of your your standard line of transforms, and that's another sort of direction we could go for sure. Given that you eliminated the obvious source of mistakes <laughs> by putting CPS first and error last. Is there any technical reason why you chose to adopt a fixed ordering, or was it simply uh, pedagogical? Um, well, uh, so, so that is actually the sense in, in which we chose a fixed ordering. Um, it, well, uh, it doesn't, other than the uh, error and continuation um, restrictions that are in there, there is nothing else that, uh, that makes a difference, I, I suppose. Uh, sorry, that, that's, that's probably not uh, quite the way to say it. Um, uh, at, at any rate, uh, I think, uh, um, there, I mean, there isn't really any, any other uh, reordering that goes on there besides that. So, for example, have you included the list transformer monad rather than, it was list monad transformer rather than list monad, then it wouldn't? then they wouldn't commute. Right. Is there any technical reason why you couldn't have done that? Um, not really. It's mostly, it's mostly just, uh, just a you know, matter of just being a, a prototype uh, to you know, we're still working on. Okay. One last question. I was just thinking a little bit more about the ordering issue, and it seemed that one of your big motivations was this idea that plus should commute. Yeah. And it seems to be the natural thing to do would be to have a second operator that specifically didn't commute, that you basically use it to indicate orderings in certain places and you reorder it in it. So, I just wanted to suggest that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good idea. Thank you. Let's, let's